All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayyid from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. So today, the, this is the discussion with uh, Europe, Asia, and Africa. Hope everybody is doing safe and sound and you are healthy. Uh, let us start with our discussion. So what I'll do is this. Right in the beginning, I'll go over some of the countries and their situation. And please recommend what countries we should observe on daily basis. So that is one. And then I would look at some of the top news at this time that are here in the US. These may be good or bad news. I do not know, but they are news. And then finally, we'll answer your questions as well. So with this, before even I go there, let's talk about the temperature. So I just saw a um, question from Sumit. Uh, Sumit said, here is a question. Sumit said, can you give me your views on the following? Any temperature above 99 degree Fahrenheit is recorded as fever, but medicated only when it, when it crosses 102 or 100 uh, Point two, maybe that's what you or hundred two, according to your armpit or oral is preferred. So let's answer this question. Very common question. So first of all, uh, it is generally said that viral infections, or generally observed that viral infection fevers are usually at the lower levels, hundred, hundred one, and so on. So I should not even call them fevers. They are feeling of a higher temperature or slightly higher temperature. Fever has a definition of a cut point above, I think, 100, 100. 100.5 or something. So viral infections, low grade fevers. Bacterial infections, usually high grade fever. Now, normally, our body raises the temperature because it prefers to fry or cook the pathogen at higher temperatures or generally at higher temperatures pathogens find it difficult to replicate. And I'll give you an example of the SARS-CoV-2 or coronaviruses. Coronaviruses actually prefer to live in a cooler place. And in our body, this pharyngeal area and the nasopharyngeal area is cooler because the, the air is going in and out all the time. And because of that, they live here. And that is also is important that they start replicating in winter because the temperatures fall and they love to be in the cool temperature. On the other hand, same coronaviruses, but the SARS-CoV-2 is capable of working at the higher temperatures as well. This is why SARS-CoV-2 can actually go down in our lungs and in the rest of our body and still replicate there. Other coronaviruses cannot do this. So that means just from this example, you can at least say that coronaviruses prefer cooler temperatures, except the SARS-CoV-2. Similarly, there are many other pathogens that like to replicate or increase in cooler temperatures. And so they do not like warmer temperature. Our body knows this. So what happens is that when an infection occurs, some of the inflammatory cytokines that are produced, for example, interleukin-2, they would cause fever. And how do they cause fever? They would go to our, our hypothalamus. Over there, they will go and change our set point for the temperature. And they would make us feel that a higher temperature is actually the normal. So the body goes to that temperature and stays there. That allows the body to kind of uh, take care of the pathogen better. And pathogen replication reduces as well. This is why within limits, it is actually OK to let fever occur because it is helping combat the infection. The problem is that when it goes 103, 104, 105, that is where the damage can start occurring. And what is the damage? At higher temperatures, our proteins, cell proteins, they start becoming D-shaped. If I give you an extreme example, just like we fry an egg and the egg becomes D-shaped and coagulated, at higher temperatures, some of our proteins start malfunctioning and that can cause seizures and that can even cause death. So this is why if you are up to 102, normally the doctors say, you know what, leave it there. But if it goes above that, then start reducing it. When you reduce the temperature right in the beginning, you are giving pathogen a chance to continue to replicate easily because you're giving them better temperature. So that is one. And please realize that there are some folks who are old enough that they cannot sustain a higher temperature. So it has to be different from person to person. So that is one. Second is which temperature is a better measure of or reflection of the actual temperature. It is said that the rectal temperature or anal temperature, 
or rectum is the most accurate temperature. Now, what is the relationship of that from mouth? So if we take mouth as standard, easiest area to get the temperature from, the rectal temperature is actually one degree higher. And if we take rectal as the most accurate one, that would mean that if my mouth is reading, let's say 100, then the rectal will be reading 101 and actual would be 101. Now, how are these various temperatures measured to each other? Uh, mouth is usually one degree below the normal or most accurate. But if we take mouth as a standard, ear, ear is higher than the mouth right here. So ear is one degree higher, 0.5 to 1 degree Fahrenheit higher than the mouth. So if you register 100 in mouth, you would register 101 in the ear. That is the same case for anus as well. So if you go down to armpit, so armpit is below the mouth. So armpit's temperature is also 1 degree below. This is not a rule that if something is below, it's just a way to remember. So armpit is usually one degree below the mouth. Then if you go up to forehead, so let me back up. Mouth, ear is higher, so one degree high. Armpit is lower, one degree low. Now we reverse it. Go up from mouth, forehead, one degree low, and go below from mouth, anus, one degree high. So that is how they are. Uh, they, their correlation is. Anus is supposed to be the most accurate. That means if you're doing a mouth measurement, then anus would be about one degree higher. And the rest we, we just discussed. So with this, let's uh, continue our discussion. I'm going to very quickly look at some of these. Uh... So first of all, here is drbean.com. Then this is the vaccine. Uh, situation in the world. So 726 million doses have been given. Almost a billion people, huh? So if you see here, uneven access. So see if there are the countries, India 12.9%, China, and so on. So, And the population is the greatest in these areas. And then if you see here, Israel is... 56.4% population coverage. So I would rather look here. This is much more um, telling. So if you see here, US, 174 million or 175 million doses given, 33.7% first dose and 19.9% two doses. So not very good coverage yet, meaning not enough coverage to stop the virus or reduce the R0 enough coverage to start protecting some of the vulnerable people. Uh, if you go down here to India, India is still 6% first dose and 0.9% two doses. So I would even take the first dose as a number to use. So six is way low yet. And I hope once again that from the policy standpoint, those folks who are more vulnerable, they are getting it. So generally some protection should be there that India would not be reducing the spread with this percentage of the um, uh, dosage. EU, Europe, 13.6%. UK, 47.6% for the first dose, impressive and good, and 9% two doses. So their first dose, 47% has done miracles for them. I think that that is what is going on. Brazil, 10.5%. Brazil is generally not doing good. Turkey 12, Germany 13, Indonesia 3, France 15. We're going to look at the numbers of Germany and France. So keep this in mind that 15% first dose and 13% first dose. Italy 13%. So that is the dosage. So not a lots of other than UK or Israel, not a very large number of people getting uh, vaccinated. So now let's look at some of the countries. Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe is, I think, not vaccinated a lot, but they have the ivermectin going on. And look at this. Beautiful results here. Active cases have really gone down. So their lowest, of course, other than zero, zero would be the lowest. But if you see between the peaks, their low numbers have been 164 or, or so. 
and they are at this time about 706 so about seven times higher but at their peak peak 10000 so 100 to 10000 and now back to 700 so beautiful recovery and i think that they would continue to have that recovery debts are following the same pattern and i love this so zimbabwe is doing very good so congratulations to zimbabwe and i hope that they continue to improve this way india india this is what kind of worries me as well as much as i'm i feel that india has the wisdom that they were able to take care of the first wave as well with the ivermectins and with hydroxychloroquine and with zinc and with vitamin d and then usage of steroids so i think they are not bound majority many of the states are not bound by if fda said it or if who said it they are actually figuring out their own ways they have to protect their people so that gives me comfort but if you see here this wave just continues to go taller and taller it is compressed as well that means it is rapid so it is spreading fast and it is spreading to more people and that is why it is becoming taller so that is the concern there which i think needs to be taken care of my hope is and i've said it before as well that they would at some point the population would say you know what this is not good and they would start doing social distancing masks and ivermectins and those things but yet i don't see the result of that um this is the currently active cases they're almost similar to the previous peak and then um, here is the daily deaths as well and it is important, I would remiss if I don't mention it, that I had done a comparison of the states a few days ago. And we saw that the state, for example, Uttar Pradesh is the one where ivermectin has been given. And over there, the infection rate is 0.3% compared to Maharashtra, where ivermectin, I think, is not given. Plus, Mumbai is in there, which is one of the largest cities. And so over there, the infection rate is 2.8%. So almost what nine ten times more infection the death rate was simple so that means similar so that means if some people become infected then the outcomes are similar but people who are becoming infected are less in uttar pradesh compared to maharashtra so uh, this is what is happening in india uk so if you see here i love this i i am so much so glad about uk so uk had been consistent at 6000 so every day when i would look at it i say okay so they are just here now they're stuck at this level and now all of a sudden they halved it further they reduced it to another half and now they are at 3000 2000 which is excellent and if you see here active cases are going down and i'm sure that the deaths are following that pattern as well so wishing them good luck i wish that their cases and their deaths stop very soon there is a tiny bit of a danger that on 12th they are going to start reopening the society if this is because of the vaccination then the reopening of the society would not create a huge spike and if it is because of the social distancing lockdowns masks and if people are not careful when they start coming in contact then we'll see a spike as well and i wish really at this time if uk had started ivermectin prophylaxis now to say guys two weeks every two weeks one dose of ivermectin and we are opening the society anyways i think it would have been a miraculous outcome for them so still praying for them that they do not become worse than this beautiful progress they've made okay so daily new cases in france these were going up but if you see now they are kind of trending downwards but what i do not know is that if there is anything france is doing to bring that trend downwards active cases are still up or total active cases and here if you see the deaths are kind of consistent slightly um, lower trend but still higher germany so Germany has a second peak as well, kind of sparse and controlled. But there is a second, actually third wave. So first wave, second broad wave, which had multiple waves in it. And now the third wave, it seems like getting curtailed. We'll see. And yeah, it seems like it is going down right here. So that is good. But still, it is a peak. And if you see here, 
deaths are following that as well. Still a lot more controlled compared to where we were here, 1,200 deaths per day, for example, and here we are 300, so four times less. Italy, Italy, so first wave here, then the second wave, then it just continued on to another wave and then continued on to the third and fourth or second and a half and third and a half maybe. So this wave is there. It seems like going down again. Um, again, as we saw that the percentage is not a lot for vaccinated, but at the same time, we have to also keep in mind that there were a lot of people who got infected as well in the first go, in the first wave. So cases are coming down, but not, not very good. And I think one of the reason, I would think a couple of reasons. What I do not know is about the mask wearing and the social distancing, uh, but I think ivermectin is not being used liberally in these areas. And number two, I think vaccination is not that much. So if ivermectin, if for some reason, and I really, really support FLCCC for this, that they are, they are doing something that I usually kind of find it difficult to do, and that is to reach out to politicians to say, hey, guys, we are trying to influence you. Here is some data. Do the right decisions. They are doing it. They're just continuously hammering the politicians and the uh, folks who can make a decision. That is a good thing. So Israel, just to see that Israel has been vaccinating their folks. So Israel, look at this. Just like Zimbabwe. So Zimbabwe pulled this off with, I believe, ivermectin. Israel is doing this with vaccine as well. So here, very good outcome. The cases, 4,459 active cases. Between the in initial times, their active cases were about 2,000 when they went down from the first wave and never have been to 2,000. So this is the first time they actually are approaching back towards 2,000. So very good. And I would suspect that the deaths are following that as well. So if you see, this is also reducing. So good job on Israel's part. Uh, some news for uh, ivermectin. And I know that my friends from UK become very upset with ivermectin. But this is the news. I did not make up this news. Still, it is interesting to keep this in mind. If If it is unfairly beating up AstraZeneca, even then it is interesting to see that, hey, look, people are just attacking AstraZeneca. If it is a fair news, then we should actually see this as well. It pertains to us. So Australia has stopped AstraZeneca for people under 50. And I would suspect that mostly women and then maybe also women on um, contraceptives. So that is Australia. And then if you see here, this is US. So US has actually said two things that were interesting. And I read them this morning. One, they said that maybe we will not use AstraZeneca. We have enough dosage already from um, Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, and Moderna. So that is one. Secondly, they took that plant, that um, manufacturing facility where AstraZeneca was being made. And there was a mix up a few days ago. So now it almost seems like a deliberate news. I'm not cons I'm not trying to conspire here. But the result of all of that is that AstraZeneca has been removed from there. And that whole manufacturing facility is given to Johnson & Johnson. And with that, the follow up is that US is saying, you know what, we may not need AstraZeneca. So this is the AstraZeneca news. I think they're not getting a break. They just continue to have that. So with this, now I'm going to come back here and see what are the questions we have. So let's see. <clears throat> I'm going to start from the most fresh part. I'm sorry to folks who may have written questions before that scrolled. Uh, Catherine says, question also, is there blood clot risk for women on hormone replacement therapy? Thank you. So uh, ideally not. Because hormone re replacement therapy is kind of trying to replace the hormone in the same way uh, to the right levels. In the contraceptive therapy, there is more than normal that we're trying to produce. But still, um, I'm saying in theory not for two reasons. One, it is keeping the hormones at the normal level. Number two, the age is going to be greater. So what is not known is that is it really because of hormones? If it is because of hormone 
replacements or external usage of hormone, then any age should be vulnerable to it. But I don't think that they have seen that data. Uh, Maro says, in the UK, T cell test will cost about 200 pounds, but will it work after 15 months from infection? So Maro, this is something that we should do. This is something to be figured out. The company said that we do not know how long the T cell would live. So we do not know if how we cannot predict how long it would stay positive. And I understand this from my previous textbook uh, studies, the T cell and the and the studies online, the T cells have been found for SARS-CoV-1 to be there even after 10 years. So as much as I know that it, it is 200 pound, I would actually suggest if you can, and if somebody can get it, then get it and see what happens. Um, it will be interesting to see that. Anubhav says, can you look at Kerala, India? It is using avamectin and has three times less deaths compared to other states, which have the same number of cases. Just type India COVID numbers and you'll get the state chart. Let's do it. That is very, very interesting. OK, so if I go here and I say Kerala, India, COVID, or I should have just said state chart. Um, WHO cases in India by state. Here we have Kerala, Kerala, confirmed 1.1 million, active 29,000, recovered 1.1, disease 4.6. I would like to see that numerical chart that we saw once before. So India, COVID state wise okay state wise maybe that would bring it i remember i had seen it once before okay i think it was on ndtv the last time i saw this this one So Kerala cases 11 million and then active this much. The question is, what is the population of Kerala? Kerala population. Is there a state chart? So 34 million. So if I click it, will it go there? I wanted to see the Kerala's own chart itself. So out of... Uh, 34 million. I can't say this without looking at the chart. Uh, but let's see. Out of 34 million, the death rate is, of course, higher for Maharashtra than here. So it seems like Kerala is doing better. But I, here is how I would have wanted to look at the chart. Number one, what is the total population? Then compared to that, what is daily change? And then what is compared to that, the um, deaths. And that would give us a better idea of daily uh, control over this. Uh, Helena says, risk benefit for vaccination for patient with, patients with progressive sclerosing cholangitis. Is mRNA vaccine good for them? Many thanks. So uh, Helena, I cannot give a, a specific patient's situation's solution. I cannot. I just am. That's not right. I do not know their history. I cannot talk about it. But generally, when we talk about um, sclerosing cholangitis or when we talk about generally um, inflammatory diseases as well, it is actually fine to take vaccines. They have given vaccines to majority of the folks with the comorbidities without any issue. If you think about it, what is the role of the vaccine? A vaccine is like... And I know that now there are many people who are going to say this is a gene therapy and this is a depopulation thing. A vaccine is like getting cold virus. 
So while we have many of these comorbidities, we get cold virus many times and we recover from there. A vaccine is in a similar ballpark. The problem, for example, I'll take Netherlands as an example, that in Netherlands, when they were administering the vaccine, people started dying who were fragile, who were terminally ill, who were not doing well. And they said, OK, you have to look at patients history plus their current state before putting them through vaccine because vaccine can cause side effects which may not be tolerable by the patient. So that is their state. And a disease does not tell me the state. So for this, the best way is to talk with the doctor. They, they should see what is their current state of the body and then decide. So GB says, question, sir, should we do a PF4 antibody test after AstraZeneca vaccine to rule out hit like condition? So ideally, after three, four days, one should be able to get those done. And this test is available. This is what I've been uh, uh, making noise about that. Fine, we know this. So, so look, my wife has Johnson & Johnson. That is also an adenovirus based vaccine and can cause clotting. What I have done is I've put her on thinners since she took it just so that if there is any such chance, it stays low. I cannot advise others to do that. But this is what I am, how I am preparing for my own wife. Uh, at the same time, yes, if somebody can get this after third, fourth, fifth day, if they can get it, then that is great. At the same time, clinically, it is important, like Canada did. I think Canada did a wise thing. What they did was they changed the label for AstraZeneca to say that if after this vaccine, anywhere from three days to 17 days, if you have persistent headache or blurry vision, persistent blurry vision or shortness of breath that is persistent or abdominal pain that is persistent or leg, leg cramps or the cold legs persistently, then please come back and talk with us. So that is a beautiful way to make somebody aware that if this happens, I have a way out. And the authorities are acknowledging that this can happen, so they will be ready to save me or to work with me. But if we just keep dismissing it, this is bad news, this is politics, this is people just screwing the AstraZeneca's arm and this is just not right, then doctors will not become ready. So then folks would have to figure this out. So you are correct, we should do that, but I think it should be driven from clinical as well. Uh, one more I would add, the symptom is the petechial hemorrhages or si tiny small red dots or bleeding under the skin. So um, Ilk says, did your wife experience any out of normal side effects? No. So the only thing that is still uh, persistent is her knee joint pain. She had pain before, and now it is just increased for last since she has had the vaccine. So is it because of the vaccine or, or is it just something else happened? So she still cannot walk correctly because that pain is just too much. For a day or so, it became pain in both knee joints, but now it is back to the knee joint where she was hurting before, and that intensity is more. So don't know if it is because of vaccine or not. I think when it went to both, that was vaccine, and I think there is some tipping of the pain upward on this side. So uh, Kara says, daughter 32 years old, suffering long haulers. Sorry about that. One year. Sorry about that. Managed to get a metin cream, 10 milligram wood transdermal application. No, it does not help. But Kara, why not the oral? Are you somewhere in Europe and there is a problem with ivermectin? There are online sites. Again, I'm, I'm, I feel I feel sad looking at this situation, and that is why I'm, I'm in offering something that in theory can be done. And that is that many, many cool beans tell me from Europe that they have uh, online sites from India where they can get the ivermectin and they are getting it shipped to them in two to three weeks. So uh, transdermal does not help. Alexis says, I have a good doctor, but I asked him about ivermectin and he dismissed me and said, no, no explanation. So that is the, this, um, huge pandemic 
has also highlighted the issues with education with uh, in the us uh, and i think many of the european countries and many of the countries uh, we have the continuing medical education credit cmes or ce's continuing education credit and the doctors and nurses and and healthcare professionals are supposed to keep them up to date i think that system is not working that system is supposed to tell them that go find new things that are happening in studies and use them in your practice or be aware of them and here you have a huge number of doctors including who's doctors and fda's then cdc's doctors who are not only oblivious but they are so ignorant i'm sorry to say this is my group i'm talking about that they don't even want to open the books and see if there may be something to help their patients this is unbelievable um medhead 101 says chile and israel are highest vaccinated in the world but chile cases and deaths sticking up but israel not why is this i do not know exactly but let's see chile's cases what is the population of chile so this is this and if i go to bloomberg to see bloomberg us china india brazil chile so 37% so yes they are very good in their vaccination but have not reached the herd immunity type 1 so i would not expect a lot of difference yet i would expect the older age the folks who are vaccinated to be more protective protected the question is is it spreading in the youngsters but there is a wave and this is very different from uh, israel israel has number one they had original wave of infection and number two they are much more uh, they are reaching much closer to the herd so if you see here where is israel here 58% 58% is almost so 66 to 74% is herd immunity include their own previously infected people as well i think they are much closer to that chile is not there yet it is still very high so there should be some results seen which i think are not being seen so this is still curious to me to see why this is the practice are they not social distancing is the vaccine not working do do they have a different variant um it 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 is curious i'll have to work on it so if uh, coolbean liza is here maybe we can uh, we can research about chile Scarlett Monahan says, "If you're taking ivermectin as a prophylaxis and have a go, and have medical treatment, and have to go and have medical treatment or an operation, can it affect the anesthetic or outcome of the operation? No, no. So the um, the role of ivermectin has been number one to bind with the spike protein of the virus. That has nothing to do with other medical conditions and their treatments." the other is that it can disrupt rdrp enzyme of the virus now when you are taking a um, medic uh, you're getting a medical operation or some medical treatment the rdrp other than getting infected during that treatment and rdrp of a virus is there and then the ivermectin might might help with that there's nothing more the only area where ivermectin might be influential is the inflammation that is the ivermectin disrupts nuclear factor kappa beta pathway and that reduces the inflammation and usually after medical procedures inflammation is usually reduced so if at all ivermectin may be supportive you are correct and uh, gb it's not just india it's everywhere look at us 
So Bashir says, I got headaches that might be related to my eye problem or the vaccine AstraZeneca. I'm not sure. Just got the glasses five days ago, but still got mild headaches. Goes away by PCM, but gets back on aspirin too. So uh, Bashir, it really depends. When did you receive the dose? When did it start? How did you get blurry vision with that? If it is within three days to 17 days of the first dose of AstraZeneca, it is not seen with the second dose, the first dose of AstraZeneca, then this may be because of the AstraZeneca as well. And you should talk with your doctor. They should. There are a, a Pixaban or a Rivaroxaban or IVIG or IV3 are some treatments they can use. They should, of course, not use heparin because heparin can cause a similar effect as well. But they can use other uh, um, blood thinners. Anubhav says, Anubhav, you should get a, an award for questions and good questions. When should a person do an antibody test after getting the second dose of AstraZeneca to find antibodies? So if you think about it from their point of view, seven days after AstraZeneca it becomes complete, or whatever number of days they have suggested, seven or 14, that is when they think that the antibody numbers are there. Ed Mohan, Edmond uh, HR says, how accurate are the vaccine accuracy numbers? How are they sure people were actually exposed and protected? No idea yet. Andre says, during vaccine trials, did anyone measure anti-spike antibody levels for people who get infected so we could have an estimate of the titer from which we can assume immunity so good point here you have a suggestion in this comment but i don't think that they have done that or if they have done we haven't seen those studies yet so mamo samo says hello dr bean can you please explain if there is any risk of autoimmune diseases due to mrna vaccines so this is a very common rumor out there that somehow mrna vaccines would change our immune system or our DNA of the cells, which would then cause autoimmune diseases. Or the mRNA vaccines would cause our cells to produce the spike proteins forever, which would then in turn cause the immune system to respond incorrectly forever. At least these kind of theories are not possible mechanistically. Now, is there some other problem that can end up in the autoimmune disease? I do not know. But these theories with the mechanisms that are there are sort of BS mechanisms. So they may have to be, if there is such a chance, we will have to figure out what is the science behind that. I am not aware of any such science so far. So Art Patron Forever says, Sinopharm probably developed in Wuhan back in 2018. New would be big seller later. That also means that Sinopharm may be the, the best antidote. GB says, question, sir, is acetyl, acetolopram a prothrombotic drug? Should be test start before it? This is a very important question and should we talk with the doctor? Here's a deal. Somebody who's taking this is taking it because they may have a propensity towards the thrombosis. So if they stop it now, they're generally at risk of thrombosis. And then if they take AstraZeneca, so um, sorry, prothrombotic, so they would be generally at risk of thinning. And now maybe the thinning itself is more dangerous than the, than the vaccine's weight. So this has to be with your doctor's advice. They should do labs. They should see your history. They should see your current state. The, it is impossible for someone like me to even think about what should be the right answer. Because the answer comes from the history. Answer comes from the current state. Answer comes from the lab's data. Arun says, will remdesivir be resistant after some time? It is possible that um, all antibiotics, antivirals can 
a virus can become resistant to them. But so far, remdesivir has not worked at all. So the resistance is a concept that would come when the, the drug would work. So, so far, it's not been useful. But yes, in theory, the pathogen can develop um, evolution uh, mutations to escape it. But I don't think so. It's not working just in general. So ITIL says, can only first dose of AstraZeneca be considered as a booster for those who recovered from COVID? So I have done this discussion many times that somebody who has recovered from COVID, ideally, in theory, do not need any infection, any, uh, any vaccine anymore. They are just fine. But let's say that if they do want it, then first dose or second dose doesn't matter because body is already aware of the situation. The first dose the body would take care of it, sure, it would boost it. Second dose, sure, that would boost it as well. So if you take one or two, it doesn't really matter. If you are going to take it, take both. If you just want to take one, I think that is fine as well. Tanya says, is there a greater risk in taking vaccine a week after a surgery? The risk is that can a person take these side effects or not? So let's say if I got surgery today and my surgery has made me weak and let's say the surgery is on my GIT and I cannot afford to have vomiting or diarrhea and my GIT would become upset or, or the injury would open up or my abdominal injuries would open up. So in such cases, giving a vaccine is only going to cause hurt. So it really depends upon what surgery, where can the person take the side effect. So the doctor should see it this way. Here is the surgery and the wound of the surgery and the repair. And here are the worst side effects of the vaccine. And if they happen to this person, can this surgery be further exaggerated? Can the problem be exaggerated? If so, then don't. So Krishna says, how is your tinnitus doing? I have appointment for Pfizer and have mild tinnitus, so worried. So I am OK at this time. My ear did become a little disturbed this year um, yesterday. But today, one, I do not have pain. There is just slight feeling of soreness. I do not have pain anymore. I do not have that fever feeling. But I just woke up from rest as well for the whole night. So as the day passes, we'll see more. But generally, I. I feel much better. Yesterday uh, in the morning, I was a little congested and tired. And during the day, I became very tired or more tired than I usually feel. Meaning for the first time yesterday, I didn't want to do lectures. I didn't want to prepare. I didn't want to move from wherever I was sitting. I just wanted to just stay sitting. Uh, that so far is not the condition now. But who knows as the day progresses. And uh, as you said, so please uh, start taking some anti-inflammatories, start talking with your doctor, sa start seeing if you can take some anti-allergy as well to try to bring it down. So please talk with your doctor. I hope doctor is wise enough to kind of uh, help. Sometimes doctors just ignore the tinnitus part. Uh, fluvoxamine has been, so Dr. Drew had developed tinnitus and he said fluvoxamine tremendously helped him. And don't take fluvoxamine over the counter because it can have severe side effects up to the point of somebody wishing to kill themselves. Third says, thank you for your work. Antibody count after the vaccination is 100 to 1,000 times higher than after natural infection. Can't it exhaust the immune cells and make troubles? No, 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 no. So look, when our immune cells are really clever, our immune system is very clever. And I love it. This is why I kind of love these cells and I draw them in such beautiful ways. What happens is this will be such an amazing thing to see. Imagine I am an immune cell. Let's say I'm a T helper cell. I have a receptor. And let's say that receptor looks like this to bind with an antigen. So if there is an antigen that can fit this pattern, I will work with that. And this is the only antigen I can work with. Now let's say I am another helper cell. And my receptor is like this. That means I can fit. I can no, no longer fit this thing. 
but I can let's say fit this. Too much science here. <laughs> Too, a lot of science has called has caused things to break. So I can have this one fit in. And then there are more. So when the immune cells are born, they all have a single kind of hand. They all don't have hands like us that can be modified to fit various products. Their hand are fixed. The structure of the hand is fixed. It's, it's such a beautiful thing. So now what happens is there is just one or two cells of this type. So when the virus actually comes in, that antigen binds with this. And it kind of, uh, if it fits, right? So I, I exaggerated when I said one or two. So let's say 1,000, million. So if it fits, I will start proliferating. Proliferation means I would start increasing in numbers. So our cells are actually not always present. They are actually in smaller quantities, 10 for this kind of a hand and 10 for this kind of a hand and 10 for this kind of a hand and 10 for this kind of. So there are very and as that antigen comes in, then they start increasing and they become like millions and trillions, not trillions, billions. And they start not even billions, millions. And then they start attacking the antigen. This is called proliferation. When the antigen goes away, then they start dying. And then they go back to that same old original number plus some memory cells for the future to wake up quickly and do the function. What a beautiful mechanism. So if I look at your question and say, you know what, if antibodies count go up after the vaccine, what does that mean? I got the vaccine two days ago. In another three, four, five days, my B cells will pick up this vaccine, which would be brought to them by macrophages and by neutrophil will be chopping it up and so on, or dendritic cells. They would run from here and bring it to the lymph nodes and say, hey, guys, B cells, hey, guys, T cell, look what we got. It's something new. We have not, not seen it. And the B and T cell would just start increasing in number, the one that connect with it. And they have uh, interleukins poured on them and they would start increasing a number and they'll start making antibodies and they would keep making it for some time. And when the antigen load is not there, vaccine would not continue to produce the antigen, antigen load. So then after a few months or weeks, they would start dying. Some would leave, live like memory cells. If the infection happens again, then they would start increasing again. So that would happen with the second dose again. So uh, as you can say, immune cells will not be exhausted. They actually increase and reduce according to the body's environment. Beautiful mechanisms. This is why when uh, there are scientists who say our immunity will be depleted or this, that's just. Jess Stark says, why would hydroxy and ivermectin be used together in a treatment protocol? Uh, just for efficacy point of view, um, I have said it many times that for my patients in the beginning, I used to use hydroxy plus zinc. Then time came that ivermectin became, um, that study came out. And in Bangladesh, Dr. Alam worked with ivermectin. I started talking about their, that here in the US. So I was one of the early ones in March, April time frame. I started talking about ivermectin here. So I started talking about ivermectin and for my patients, I started using ivermectin with hydroxy and it was fine. They would actually recover faster. But I, I saw that I, hydroxy had a little bit higher uh, need for attention for the patient because they would develop arrhythmias or blood pressure changes or heart rate changes. So I slowly phased out usage of hydroxy and then continued with ivermectin. So they can be used together, but need a lot of attention. So I have 10 more minutes. Uh, maybe we continue for five minutes and I I'll, can take a break before my next meeting as well. So GB says, sir, one of some leading doctors of India is thinking about the T-helper 17 pathway disrupting, causing autoimmune dysfunction, generating PF4 antibodies after AstraZeneca, that is not the case. So the PF4 antibodies are not because the T-regulatory cell got disrupted. 
the PF4 antibody are produced because the plasma cells got generated. And you can't say that because T helper cells were disrupted, that is why the plasma cell were made. Plasma cells would always be made in some people for TPF4. T reg cells function is to suppress them. And that is what we see. The, the disease continues from three to five days to 17 days and then goes away. What happened? Why did it go away? Because the T regulatory cells controlled the situation. So Momen Yam says, can you please interview Professor Sunetra Gupta of Oxford? Um, sure, if somebody can connect me to her, I would. Professor Sunetra Gupta, what is her uh, um, position? The principal investigator in Oxford Martin program on vaccine. So um, I'll have to see what um, she stands for and if I can connect with her. So Ayan says, and let's answer a couple of more questions and then we break for today. And please remember tomorrow I'll be off and we would see each other on Monday. We would see each other this evening as well and then Monday. Ayan says, is it possible to develop rheumatoid arthritis after being infected with COVID-19? So some of the patients have reported that just like long hauling state, that they developed some autoimmune diseases. I haven't heard of joint pains or rheumatoid arthritis specifically, but we have seen that uh, the long haulers have a variety of uh, issues, which may be because of autoimmune triggers, which may be because of the virus sitting in there for a longer period of time, which may be the hit and run by the virus as it's a mechanism we talk about in pathology for viruses. So may be possible, but I've not seen data for it. Nick, and Nick, um, thank you that you're here. You're a physician. I wanted to, we are connected on Patreon as well. I wanted to request you, I was thinking about this morning, to figure out topics together if possible for diabetes sessions. I know that you're passionate about it. I know you have some opinions and some observations there as well. So maybe we can put together some uh, topics. And as you see, the way I teach is I develop from fundamental and talk about mainstream, and then we can talk about studies and deviation from the mainstream, if possible. Uh, question from Nick. If someone is asymptomatic, has positive PCR, and has robust mucosal immune response, and no systemic invasion, that is no systemic A, B, or T cell, is that person officially infected? <laughs> Very good question. So if we go to the official definition of infection, infection simply means presence of the virus. So yes, they are infected. They, then is the disease COVID. COVID means symptom. So virus has caused enough damage in the body that the body's responses and the damaged tissue is showing symptoms, then that would be a disease. So if I rephrase your question and said, if the virus is present and the immune system has taken care of it at the mucosal barriers, and even with the presence of the virus, there are no symptoms, then they really do not have COVID. We can see if they were infected. We can do testing to see if they were infected, but they don't have COVID. So this is official definitions, although we've been using it very loosely. For example, we say asymptomatic COVID. Now, there is no concept of asymptomatic disease. The reason for that is the definition of disease is the symptoms. So when a virus arrives in us, it has infected us. If it causes symptoms, then the disease has occurred. So very good question. And I think mucosal barrier uh, vaccines or sprays are very, very interesting from this point of view. Oh, Mike says, my husband had type 2 diabetes and died of COVID. Yeah, that's very sad. Very sorry for your loss. Uh, type 2 is the is one of the vulnerability. <clears throat> Fran says, there is talk of vaccine linked to female fertility issues. Could this be? Where might be the concern coming from? So generally, no, there is no such issue. Um, 
some people had reached out to me in the past and said they were trying to convince me for fertility issues. And they were saying that, hey, somehow the vaccine or the virus, especially vaccine, would cause the uterine epithelial layers to be modified. That's just not possible. One, a fertile woman's uterine internal epithelial layers would recycle every month and they would change. So making it change forever would mean the stem cells that give rise to it would have to be changed. And then having a vaccine going from the deltoid muscle towards the whole body, hone in on uterus, start tr trying to change the stem cells in the uterus or the cells that give rise to the epithelial layer or proliferating, that, that's just not observed, not seen, not possible from mechanisms point of view. So it is a rumor has been out there for a long time. And I think that this started with the term that we had vaccines that were neutralizing vaccines. And then we wanted to have vaccines that were sterilizing vaccines. The difference between them is neutralizing vaccine means when the virus arrives in our body, our spike, we capture its spike protein, we hold its hands, and we neutralize it from doing the function. And sterilizing vaccine doesn't mean it sterilizes the person. Sterilizing vaccine means that the virus cannot come in and do much or it cannot be shed out either. So when the virus is in us, in our mouth, for example, there are IgAs and they bind it very firmly and now it cannot go out. And if, even if it goes out, it is useless. And now we have sterilized the person from virus infection. And uh, that simply meant those vaccines that give rise to more IgA cells and more IgA production in the mucosal barriers would be called sterilizing. And those that do not produce a lot of IgA, for example, current vaccines, they would be neutralizing. So let's stop at this. So once again, please like, subscribe, and share. If you would not like to subscribe or share, then at least just hit like on it. That tells YouTube that, hey, this is something legit. People are liking it. That is one. Secondly, if you would like to support this work, which nowadays I think after YouTube demonetizing us, we need some support. If you would like to support us, uh, please, there are three links in the description. One is if you want to buy me a coffee. The other one is if there is you would like to become a patron. And the third one is to support this work in general. And I want to thank uh, Margaret for her generous donation yesterday. So thank you very much. And I would see you, some of you, this evening and others on Monday. Bye-bye. Stay safe and healthy.